One of the ways in which power constructs itself is by determining what is signal and what is noise. By determining what accounts as valuable information and can therefore be included in our picture of events, and what must be excluded is dangerous, hostile, or even revolutionary. The French New Wave director Francois Truffaut believed that it was nearly impossible to make an anti-war film because military conflict has become such an inherent spectacle that recording it seems to glorify the act. This poses a bit of a problem for Wizards of the Coast. Magic is a game based around combat, but because the story of the game is one of good versus evil, some warfare has to be considered better than others, and that difference must be legible at the level of the art on a card. The question then becomes, what visual distinctions do we draw between good and bad warfare? I want to begin our conversation with the vampires on Ixalan. And as with most things, I'm going to take my cue here from the set reviews by Vorthos Mike and Rhystic Studies. Here's Mike on the historical influence of conquistadors on the design of the Ixalan villains. So if, you, if you've seen any major paintings about Cortez, about any of the Spaniards, um, large scale paintings, it is always shown in preferential placement of the conquering force compared to the people that they conquered. The art depicting conquistadors engages in an early version of what Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky called manufacturing consent, in which media mobilizes support for large-scale economic, social, or military actions. A story being sold in these images is not just one of easy victory, but also of racial distinction. Europeans are depicted as a markedly different and higher species that dominates by right of that superiority. That's also revisionist history because they didn't just come in and just annihilate people. So they would have locals they would work with, and as soon as the conquistadors were here in real life, they would get rid of their armor right away. They would immediately adapt to the local, immediately get armor that is more fitting to the climate, yeah. and that idea that we think, you know, with the, the Morian hat, the weird, you know, hat, sure. um, and, and the armor is really a myth. With the benefit of retrospect, the propaganda at work in conquistador art seems obvious to us, but we should use that insight to see how our contemporary media engages in manufactured consent, how it encourages us to think of our own warfare as ennobling or romantic. We see these beautiful pictures at night from the decks of these two U.S. Navy vessels in the Eastern Mediterranean. I am tempted to quote the great Leonard Cohen. I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons. Um, and they are beautiful pictures of, uh, of fearsome armaments making what is for them a brief flight. The art team was faced with a pretty daunting challenge. How to take a triumphant visual language and give us as an audience the space to view it with a touch of irony. The designers at Wizards actually preserved these propagandistic images as a core influence, which initially seems like a terrible idea. But they've managed to use the delusions within this style as the foundation of a pretty sophisticated and subtle critique. You see, the vampires on Ixalan take the fetishization of whiteness that is present in images of the conquistadors and amplifies it to a gothic extreme. In these images, colonial ideas of racial purity are made manifestly monstrous, bloodthirsty, and parasitic, which is their true nature. Just behind the illusion of gold and nobility is the stink of the tomb. The wealth and glory of empire is built on body counts. We immediately recognize the Eternals invading Ravnica in War of the Spark as agents of evil, but it's worth pausing a moment to unpack why we have that response. At the level of historical consciousness, the relentless march of the Amunket undead recalls the uniform goose-stepping of fascist soldiers, and the blank, expressionless troops represent an aesthetic choice frequently used to indicate nefarious enemy combatants. The idea here is that while each life lost on our side is a unique individual with hopes and aspirations, an enemy casualty is merely the end of one faceless cog in the machine. That's why when we want to make a stormtrooper human, the first step is to make him mourn. 
Because more than borderlines, nationalities, or law, what defines the parameters of war is who you call a grievable body. As Judith Butler writes in her book, Frames of War, we might think of war as dividing populations into those who are grievable and those who are not. An ungrievable life is one that cannot be mourned because it has never lived. That is, it has never counted as life at all. War of the Spark is a set in which we see, on card after card, depictions of truly agonizing grief. And this makes the Eternals stand out in even greater contrast. Stripped down to a skeletal reminder of our own mortality, what are the Eternals except a perfect representation of an ungrievable body? One that denies even the memory of a life once lived. And that should get us thinking, because although we might be fine denying any emotional depth to orcs and zombies, we should be wary of how similar tactics are used to dehumanize enemies that are harder to place in the simple schematic of good and evil. As we saw with the Conquistador art, one way that an enemy can be made ungrievable is through racial discrimination. But populations can also be made less than human by insisting that they only be understood in the framework of war. When enemy combatants, and oftentimes even enemy civilians, are only regarded in the context of conquest, we are encouraged to see them as inextricable from that conflict, native not to the land being occupied, but to the state of war itself. The war in Afghanistan is nearly two decades old. How many times have you been asked to look at Afghani life outside of the toll that our battles take? And how do we rationalize letting our people live in perpetual crossfire? When it comes to the wars we wage in real life, we are compelled by social and political forces to view our enemies as ungrievable. But in the world of fiction, that function is often sublimated into the work of the big baddie. It is not us, but they who have shaped our opponents into monsters. And it is relieving to be freed from the burden of recognizing our enemies as people, just like us, with families and lives and loved ones. The Eternals, conscripted by force into a battle they have no stake in, and transported to a world they don't recognize, are in many ways citizens of war and war's greatest victims. The unsettled specter behind the War of the Spark is where and how to grieve them. And like unrecognized soldiers everywhere, the only mourning they get occurs outside of the framework.